What is the field? The world. The world. What is the seed? The word of God. The word of God. All right. Now, as we see this, this is very simple, isn't it? And we find the different kinds of people that react, how they react to the Word of God as it is sown into the world. And uh, some of the other parables relate back to this one. The, the, uh, uh, as, as we go into the, the parable of the tares. Tares are false wheat. It looks like wheat, but it isn't. And who sowed the tares in the field at night time? Satan. Satan. All right. And it was to grow up with the with the wheat. Now, the Lord found in His church at the beginning of His ministry, He called it out. He cut Israel off. They, Israel was the administrator of His kingdom. Until He came along, they rejected Him. Matter of fact, they rejected Him harshly. Then. What did they do? They murdered the king. And we're going to see the parables that teach this, just plainly what they were going to do before they did. Alright? But this one here, this parable of the sower, it lays a background for the whole period of time through church history, but especially during his ministry, you can see so much of this. Jesus was the sower. But this little church that he established, the church, that he established would be here throughout all of the church age, would it? But what about the tares? Satan would have churches too. From every shade of color of wrong to almost right, there's lots of them out there. And it's, it's for confusion. What, do, what does tares, what was the purpose of the, of the enemy sowing tares in the field? Because they look like the wheat. Confusion. confusion. <laughs> Do you see how plain what we're talking about is? It's so plain when you get down to that area. It was, it was to confuse people, to muddy the waters, so you wouldn't know what the truth is. But we do have a rule book. <laughs> An absolute rule book. Where did we finish off last week? I think we're at 12. Verse 12. 12, 13? 13. Okay. 13 and verse 12. For whoever has to him it shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. It's talking about the parables and the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, Israel had the keys of the kingdom, didn't they? Alright? They were the administrators of God's kingdom. God took that, those keys of authority away from them and told them they were kaput there in the temple area. Jesus broke the benches of the money changers, didn't he? Turned them over. He, he actually braided a whip and beat these people and ran them out of there. Now, uh, some of you know what I'm about to say because you studied this term. The word bankrupt, it actually means a broken bench. That's what it means. The word... <clears throat> bank originated in the word bench. In the ancient temples, uh, and you have to go back to, like, like we're doing right now, you have to go back in history and study the etymology of words. Alright? Uh, the ancient temples were the first banks. If you, uh, and the priests were the first bank representatives or bankers. And the bankers uh, or the priests would be in, the, in these temple areas and they would have a bench out there where they would set up and people would come and say, hey, um, I'm going to deposit with your bank, I'm going to deposit $100. And of course, every year you get interest. You could come and draw that interest and still have the $100 in there. Well, uh, this was good and fine. That, that's how it worked. But if a banker in one of these ancient temples, if he proved to be unreliable, he had his bench turned over and broken. And he was publicly whipped. And he was uh, uh, made a, a laughing stock of before all of these. And this was what you call bankrupt. Alright, this was where the term bankrupt, broken bench came from. Alright? 
bankrupt or bone convention, he was he was fined and beaten, sometimes executed for his unreliableness and because he was not worthy of the position in which he held. Israel, at the time of Jesus, the religion of Israel was man-made. It was not of God. They had changed a God-given uh, administration. There at Mount Sinai, when, when God wrote on those tables of stone the rules of the kingdom. Israel was supposed to take that, and they were supposed to be administrators in God's kingdom. They had the keys to the kingdom, because if anyone wanted to learn about God, he came to the nation of Israel. That's where God's uh, uh, word, where his truths were. No place else in the world. There are other people saved out in different places. People could pray to God, and people could be saved. Salvation is not 400 different ways in the Old Testament times and the New Testament times, as you look here. People in the Old Testament were saved by grace. And wherever a man would pray to God and ask Him to forgive him and save his soul, he was. And the Spirit of God would come and dwell in him. Like we have the Spirit of God in us today. We have a born-again spirit when we're born again. All right? In the New Testament, salvation was exactly the same. Okay? But the administrators of God's kingdom are people that He put in a place of authority. And when you're in a place of authority, all so much is expected of you. Think about that. As you're in, in the administration of God's kingdom, remember that much is going to be required of you. Alright? And let's go on down a little further. Therefore I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. They're not able, the word understand there is they're not able to put things together. Alright? Verse 14, And in their case, the prophecy of Israel is being fulfilled, which says, You keep on hearing, but you will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their eyes they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Look at this word. They have closed their eyes tightly. That's what it says in the original language. Lest, or literally it says no longer, that they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn again, and I should heal them. God, when He came to Israel, He was ready to hand the kingdom to them. The millennial reign could have come into being. This thousand year reign of Christ could have happened right here. If Israel would have listened and accepted her king, but she did not. God knew that she wouldn't. And he prophesied this in the Old Testament. And the prophecies we're going to see in these Matthew, in these parables of Matthew 13. It, it's so, you'll be able to put it together. I hope you're your spiritual minds and eyes will be opened up in these parables because they are also keys of understanding in Scripture. And if you have something that you have a problem with or, or something you want to ask me during time, feel free to do that. And I want you to feel free to, to speak up. You're not just chairs sitting out there to me. You're, you're people. 16. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Verse 17, For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Moses did not know in the Old Testament days what you know from your scriptures today. Did you know that? Moses did not know what you can look in your word in the Word of God and see today. Moses did not know it. Neither did Ezekiel, neither did Daniel, neither did Isaiah or any of those people did not have the spiritual insight that you have today because simply things have taken place since then that they couldn't understand even what they were supposed to be about. The Bible tells us about the end times, the eschatology, the last things that we are faced with. And they're here. We see that coming. We see it coming. We see all the uh, writers, commentators, 
for 1,500 years, 16, 17, 1,800 years, did not understand that God could ever call Israel back to the land again because they figured that they were completely kaput and scattered throughout the world and there was no way in the world that they could ever even come back into a land and here they are, a nation again. God said they would be, but theologians and commentators said, well, that can't be read literally, so we'll just say, well, Israel is the church. And all the promises to Israel are to the church, but that's not true. You have to separate in your mind Israel from the church at all times. Now the church is grafted into the Abrahamic promise in that God told Abraham, through your seed, singular, will all nations be blessed. Salvation that would take place was through the nation of Israel. All right? Israel was only faithful enough for one virgin. God speaks of Israel as a harlot. But there was one virgin in Israel that would be faithful enough to God to bring forth the Messiah. He picked her up. And he used her. And only in that way did she bring forth the Son of God. But God divorced that nation. And she will never be in the kind of relationship that she could have been with him before. God will use Israel in the thousand year reign of Christ and in some ways throughout all the eternal ages to come. But she will not be in his bosom like the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ will. Like that bride that he speaks of, that espoused bride that is in the world today. Here then the parable of the sower. Verse 19. Now this is a sower explained, alright? When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and he does not understand it, the evil one comes. Who's the evil one? Who's, what is the word of the kingdom? The truth is from God's word. And this evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. How much easier could that be? Plain than that. All right? And this will happen all through the church age. All through the church age. In Jesus' time and his and his own when he walked upon this earth, it happened then, didn't it? But it's happening prophetically all through the whole church age down through here. We see that. Not only that, but God, now he's telling us. He's throwing out a very simple thing as the parable of the sower. But as we go on through here, we're going to look at different aspects of that parable. As you see it, you're going to look at one area here and it's going to explode it up into another parable. How many of you ever looked under a microscope? And you pick up a feather and you look at a feather or a hair and you see the hair, the parable of the sower. Okay? When you put it under the microscope, it is the other parables. You're looking at each element and every piece of that feather or hair. Exploding in an exploded view in an exploded way. Okay? And the evil one, he snatches it away, what's been sown in his heart, and this is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. Who's the worst of it beside the road? What's that called? That's an that's a agriculture of what? A turn road. That's where you turn the plow around, you lift the plow up, you turn it around, and it's hard ground, isn't it? People have hard hearts, don't they? The human race has a hard heart, doesn't it? This is the one whom seed was sown beside the road. Verse 20. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it for joy. Remember about the rocky places? That's talking about the, the topography of the land. Here's good soil, deep soil right here, deep soil. And over here, there's an area where it's got rocky, a rock shelf below it. And as it gets up here, it's shallow soil. You can plow the ground, you might touch this hard ground, this rock with a, the tip of the plow. But you don't just, a farmer just doesn't sow part of his field. You sow the good part of the field and the bad part of the field. You sow the whole thing. You, you plant all of it. Okay? Well, the first thing that's going to come up right here, 
how many of you ever had a rock a driveway or a gravel driveway? How many of you ever have rocks along the edge of your driveway? How about out here in country roads where you see gravel on the side of the road and there's a rock out there and wherever you see a rock, sometimes there's grass growing up around it. It grows up around because it gathers moisture and heat where it germinates. But what happens to it real fast? It dies. It just grows up and dies. And that's a little wheat because the roots couldn't go very deep here, could they? And this ground is hot in the summertime. It's hot. It's so hot it cooks the wheat. I tell you what, if you try to live for Christ being a lost man, it's real hard. Did you know that? It's real hard living for Christ as a lost man. It's a more difficult life than if, than if you have a born again spirit in your in your in yourself, in your being. Because Christ is there. People we talked about my mother's grandmother this morning a little bit. Uh, she literally tore her family apart with religion. She was convicted of sin that she was living in, and instead of taking care of the problem and repenting of her sins, she started throwing money at the church, so much money at the church that her family was starving. She figured she could buy her away. And it tore up her, her husband and her family and everything in her life. And her family was ripped apart forever because of that. And the, the cause of Christ was hurt. But the, the foundation was on the wrong foundation. It was on the wrong foundation. Because I'll tell you what, you'll never do enough to get to the door. Heaven. You, it's the cost that Christ paid. We talked about this morning uh, Raqqa in the, in the Sunday school class. We talked about uh, empty handedness. We studied in the Old Testament where it says, and don't you come to me with without something in your hands, with empty hands. Without a sacrifice. We can't come to God without the blood of Jesus Christ. We can't come to Him empty handed. In Matthew 5, and I think it is verse 22, it says to uh, call your brother a fool. There's a term, raka means empty handed. It also translated someplace empty headed or, or a fool. But what it's really saying is, don't tell your brother, I wish you were damned. I wish you would go to hell. Don't do that. That's what it's talking about there. You don't have a price. I wish you to be without price before God. That's damned, isn't it? Empty-handed. Because we cannot come to God empty-handed. If the religion you have does not have the blood of Jesus Christ in it, you're bad shape. Bad shape. Let's go on a little bit further now. And the one who, uh, on whom the seed was sown is on rocky places. This is a man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. When affliction and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Like I said, it's hard to live a Christ, a life for Christ if Christ is not in you. You have to have the price of Christ in your hand. And then in verse 22, then, and the one who, on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. False religion. False religion carries away the gospel from people's hearts. It, it, it leads them astray. It leads them out in the, uh, in the bushes and the brambles and the thorns. And then it says, And the one of whom seed was sown on good ground, this is the man who hears the word and understands it. And indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. That's what pays for the sowing of it. You know, God created mankind. Is God sovereign? What's the word sovereign mean? Is God sovereign? What does sovereign mean? He's God so He can do whatever He wants to. God created man in His image. Didn't He? Is that what it says? In the first chapter of the book of Genesis. 
God said, I create man in my shadow casting likeness and my blood flowing likeness and my spiritual and my eternal likeness. Now when man was created, he was, he was created from that point of time on. He is an eternal forever being. God said uh, He took uh, uh, Adam and formed him as He formed the dust of the ground and He breathed into him the breathings of lives. That's what it literally says from Hebrew. And He became a living soul. He became a living soul. In us, our, we were in Adam, that is, at that very time, our lives. Every life that would ever be born in the human race was in Adam. God breathed into Adam. You were there in your life, not in mind, body, and everything, but in life. That life that God breathed into Adam. Brother, you were there. When He breathed into Him, the breathings of lives, breathings of lives, plural, not just Him, but plural. All of our lives throughout all, all time, as we know. And man was created and he is an eternal being. You will either spend eternity with God or you will spend eternity away from God. Once you've been born, it's forever. There's two destinies, but one, one is with God and one's away from God. Verse 24 now. And he presented another parable on the same, them the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now here we go unto a different aspect of that parable of sower, all right? We're going to look at a limb, a patch in the field, all right? And let's see what he has to say here. Another parable said unto them, and the, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Who's the man? Who is the man? Jesus. Jesus is God. Alright? And where's the field? What the field is the world. Alright? And what is the seed? The word of God or the gospel of God, the good news, the same good news that God spoke to Abraham and to Adam all the way back in time. But while men were sleeping, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat. And went away. Slipped away is what it says. He slipped away. We do from the parable of the sower that Christ came to the world, didn't he? Christ came to this world. He walked in the garden with Adam. He said in the cool of the evening, he taught Adam all that Adam knew. Adam named all of the animals, and as far as I can tell from the Hebrew language, he named everything that existed, including things you can't see. And you don't know about it. He named all the fish of the sea and all the birds of the air. And we haven't even found them all today. And Adam named them all. But why? Because God showed them to him. He introduced them to him. God was Adam's teacher. But Adam decidedly, because God created man in his sovereign image, man has a sovereign will, a want to. He has a volition. Brother Roger talked about the volition of man. Talk about sovereignty of God, we talk about the volition of man. God created man in his sovereign image also. In other words, there's choice there. Choice. <coughs> While men were sleeping, the enemy came. Who is that enemy now? The devil, demonic, religions. While we men were sleeping, sleeping, when did these things come in? In the dark. When people were supposed to be asleep, here comes Satan. Satan never sleeps. As far as I can tell from the scripture, he's always busy trying to overcome and destroy 
the plans of God. And by the way, he does know the scriptures. He knows the scriptures. So tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident. Why? Now, tares look like wheat. Tares stand up just like wheat. But the, the heads of the tares are light because there's nothing in them. The wheat, the little grains of wheat are heavy and they bow down. They bend over. So we have some standing up straight and we have some bending over. And the ones that are bent over are what? That's the true wheat. That's the genuine article. Alright? A lot of people have said, well, this is the true believers of God because they are humbled. And the other ones are standing on their own righteousness. Apply that to it if you want to, because it's it's symbolic of that. <clears throat> and the slaves of the landowner and came to said to him, "Who are these slaves? Who are the slaves of the landowner? Land the seed. The seed. The church. All right. During this age, it's the the administration in the kingdom, and those are the churches through the New Testament churches." And we look at God and say, Lord, why do you allow this? This is His permissive will. The Bible teaches that in the last days that there's going to be a great drawing because of the love of money and wealth toward the Middle East. God, in the original creation of God, He created the heavens and the earth. And we find Satan rebelled against God sometime between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And it says in Genesis 1, in beginnings God created the heavens and the earth, and then verse 2 it says, and she became, the earth became, formless and void. Something happened between the original creation and what happened there. You see, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 tells you the what. What happened there, Brother uh, Fernando? What happened during that period of time? Satan. Satan went to ascend to the throne of God and we have the fall of Satan and when Satan fell he destroyed the creation of God. And from what I can figure out there were a lot of dinosaurs on this earth and a lot of life forms that don't even exist now but God created these things and they were magnificent animals. Satan destroyed it. I drilled oil wells and I have drilled into these fossils miles deep in the ground. They're there. How did they get there? I believe that God allowed Satan. Now, he could have, he could have zapped him instantly. Couldn't he? And just put him away and thrown him into hell right then. But he allowed him to rebel and destroy. And then God rebuilt it. Rejuvenated the earth in Genesis, the first chapter. And reconstructed it. As we see, then we hear the history of the but the family histories of the heavens and the earth and all the animals and everything. That's what it says. The genealogies are the family histories of them. During that time, there were oil deposits in the earth. Well, for 4,000 years, man didn't have much use for oil besides they took, uh, uh, the Caesars took and put a little pitch and, and, and uh, tar on Christians and would set them on fire and watch them burn with this tar around them. But, and they took some of the oil that was a little lighter and they used it for grease and things. But in the, in the 19th and the 20th century, the real need for that oil became evident. And people started marketing the oil. The permissive will of God. Now, one of the greatest oil pools in the world is over there in the Middle East. And everybody in the world is interested in that pool of water. Or not water, but black gold underneath the ground. <coughs> and that's what's drawing this nation over there and drawing all nations against the Middle East. That's what we're doing over there right now. It's oil interest. Resources. Natural resources that people want. They want to lay hands on that stuff. And they want to keep control over it. And it is strategically necessary 
for buffer zones between Russia and the United States and China and all this. They, this is our playground over there. Afghanistan has been to give Russia and the United States playground for many years. We've been fighting little wars over there with these people. And now we're fighting them. We've got problems over greed, over what's in the ground and what's over there. People want that stuff. That's, that's God's permissive will. He is allowing this. The last days, it says, we're going to be drawn where what was the cradle of humanity, the birthplace of humanity, is also going to be his burial place. You know what? That's going to bring that's the birthplace and the graveyard of mankind over there. And it's drawn, the whole world is going to go against that area in these last days of these last battles. We see that taking place right now, and we just sat back and look. I mean, I'm talking to the theologians in different places and everything. I said, what do you think? And they said, that's it. This is it. This is the last days. This is, you know, all the drawing, everything that the Bible has said before here. Here we see it. We're seeing it happen in our time. How close are we to the end, to the rapture? I don't know, but it can happen any time as far as I can tell. Because the troops have been mustered. The apple <laughs> is there. Everybody wants it. Everybody wants that brass ring. Everybody wants that area over there. The Dead Sea is one of the most valuable pieces of ground in the world. Did you know that? The Dead Sea. There's more minerals, gold, silver, and all types of, uh, of, of minerals in that sea that it's... They say that it is equal to more than all the money that's ever been printed in the world. What that little area is worth. And those and that those oil fields over there are worth fortunes. The people that are there, the inhabitants, the indigenous people there, they don't care anything about it. They want us out of there and just leave them alone. Just stay out of their lives. But we have interest in it. Money can be made all of that stuff. And that's the drawing power of all of this. But while men were sleeping, the end became and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprang up and bore again, the tares became easily seen or evident. And the slaves of the land owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then did these... How, where did these tares come from? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? You know, during the Dark Ages, and when the Catholic Church had great power in its hands, it went out and it destroyed kingdoms in the name of religion and forced people to become citizens of the Catholic Empire by the sword. You either were baptized or you died, one or the other. Jesus said, that's not the way my kingdom is going to run. This will let them be. Just let them be. Just coexist with them. Just let it happen. Look, why, the Bible tells us to pray for the kings and stuff. I don't want to, you know. <laughs> we pray for them. But where, what's going? What's happening in these days that we see? What's drawing them over there? It said to them, an enemy has done this. Don't you want us to go out and gather them up? And he said, no. Lest while you're gathering up the tares, you might root up the wheat with them. Don't do it. Just leave things be. I'll take care of it. I remember D.S. Madden, one of my teachers, used to say, he said, uh, when they were over there working in those areas, they'd come into an area uh, in World War II, and he'd say, just kill everybody out there. God knows he is. He'll take care of them. Just kill everything in sight. When you go in here, just shoot and kill and go on. We're taking ground and we're not going to give it up. Just kill everything that moves. God knows He is. He'll protect what's His. And sometimes that's the way it happens to us. Verse 11, 30. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. 
And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now we're jumped all the way to the rapture now. Did you know that? We jumped all the way from the beginning of the church age all the way over to the rapture. Right here. Then he said this let things go coexist all the way through the church age. This leave it be. I don't want you going out there and killing one Jehovah Witness. Not one Mormon. Leave them be. Preach the word of God to them. If that don't work, forget it. All right? Don't, don't you cut one of the throats. Don't kill any of them. Don't try to take them out of this world. And send them to heaven. Send them to hell soon. Too soon. Or whatever. Just let it be. But we jumped all the way from when Christ was preaching during His earthly ministry all the way over to the rapture. The Bible says in the last days there will be a binding of the tares. A binding of the tares. The religion of the Antichrist will be a one world religion. There won't be any boundaries. No more boundaries. They're going to all pray in one name in one place and they're just going to worship God. This is the beginning of the reign of the Antichrist. And the binding, this one world incentive. The world is going to be in such a bad condition that it's going to draw all the western nations together, basically is what it says. And bind them. And they are bound. And what else takes place? The gathering up of the real wheat. And what was that? That's, that's the Lord. That's when God's people are gathered up. And after God's people are gathered up and out of, out of the way, then what's going to happen to the earth? The first three and a half years of the tribulation period is going to be a time of peace and safety, the Antichrist says. The one world religion. All be praying together in, in, in one type of religion. We're going to... Baha'ism, uh, Buddha, uh, Islam, all of them are going to worship the same. All the boundaries. No boundaries will exist at all. They'll just worship God. And in your mind, whatever God is, that's what it's going to be. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the week, in the middle of this tribulation period, what is the Antichrist going to do? To, and his, his, by the way, the Lord's bride is who? The churches. All right, through the New Testament churches. That's the bride of Christ. Who is the bride of the Antichrist? She's also the whore of the book of Revelation, too. False religious system that he raises up and nurtures for three and a half years. What's, what's the, what did the Lord do for his bride? He died for her. What is Satan going to do to his bride? He's going to murder her in the middle of that tribulation period. He's going to kill her and destroy her, and men say, don't worship God, but worship me. And of course, when people worship the Antichrist, they will be really worshiping Satan in proxy, because he's the embodiment of Satan. So we see the binding of the tares, we see the snatching away, the gathering, the harvest, and we see the devastation, the burning of the field. All right? The burning of the field off that's the tribulation period. That's the time that God clears the field. Five out of, out of every six Gentiles in the world will be killed. Two out of every three Jews will die. There won't be very much life left on this earth to start that millennial reign with Israel there. God is going to mark and save some of Israel to be on this earth. Dakota, you want another cough drop? I have water here for Dakota, here. Get another cough drop. Okay, help me. <clears throat> Verse 31. Now we have another parable. Another parable. What does the word parable mean? What does it mean? It comes from Paul Bala, which means what? Balo. That means I throw, and we get a word ball from that, and then para means beside. Okay? To throw something spiritual 
if you're trying to teach a spiritual lesson, you throw something physical to explain it. All right? He presented another parable unto, say, unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. How many of you ever know what wild mustard is? It's a plant, you know, it's, you can see it all over the place. How did you get there, by the way? The Spanish brought seed. The Spanish brought mustard seed to this country when the conquistadors came over and went from one end of this country to the other, and they threw this mustard seed out, and when they were going their way back, they just followed their, their mustard trail back. How many of you knew that? <laughs> They threw out this mustard seed and they followed this trail back because of mustard seed and that's how the mustard was sown into this land. All right, The Spanish sown it as they were going across and going across the state plains and, and as they established the missions up and down California. This, well, actually, there were slave plantations, what they were doing. Well, they were bright. They were yellow flowers. Yeah, they were yellow flowers. So uh, they could see it from a long way. Yeah, they could see the trail before they went from a long way when they went back, you know, they would go into an area and be gone for six months, sometimes crossing the country or whatever, and they could find their way back. That was a trailblazing, so to speak. So they could see this trail. Well, this uh, kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Now, when you sow mustard seed, you expect mustard to come up, don't you? When you sow wheat, what do you expect to come up? Wheat. All right? Now, who do you think the man is again? God. All right? He sowed herbs in his field, in his herb garden. And he expects herbs to come up, except what happens? Something different happens, doesn't it? Mustard seeds, which a man sowed in his field, And it says here that and it's uh, smaller than all the other seeds. It's, mustard seed is much smaller than wheat. It's much smaller than uh, oats or any of those. It, as far as the seed goes, it's a very small seed as far as a what you call a harvest crop. What do you do with mustard seed? People use it in pickling, and they use it to grind up and make the mustard that you, the prepared mustard that you have. And it's a spice. It's also a preservative. People use this, and it's a it's a crop that can be harvested. Okay. It's smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants. But something happens here, and it says it becomes a tree. It becomes a tree. Now, the, the average mustard plant does not grow into a tree, does it? doesn't grow into a tree. It gets about this tall or so, something like this, and it has yellow flowers on top of it. But it's not a tree. But this mustard seed here that was sown, It says it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now this mustard tree became a monstrosity. This mustard tree became an, an idea. What do you call a monster? A monster. This mustard tree should have been a plant, but it became a tree. And this tree is what is going to become Christendom.
Christendom. A Christendom is not Christianity. Christendom names Jesus Christ, but it does not believe in the efficacious work of Christ and Him alone as salvation. Christendom names their churches, but they are not the Lord's churches. If you ask a member of Islam today, a Muslim, ask them about what they think about Jesus Christ. What do you think you'll find out that they say about Jesus Christ? Do you think that they'll deny that he was a prophet of God? No. They'll say he's a prophet of God. He's all right. We, we believe in him. We're, we're uh, <clears throat> we believe in Christian philosophy and theology, and we accept that him as a person that lived in history that was a good man and he died. But the greatest prophet is who? According Mohammed. To Mohammed. Mohammed. They're not going to deny Christ. If you ask the Buddhists, what about Jesus? He always he's a great prophet of God. Great prophet of God. If Baha'i, he's a, Jesus a great prophet of God. But out here in, in all of that is what is called Christian myth. Where the branches of all the isms live. Well, the devil's roost. The birds of the air. By the way, who is the kingdom? Who is the king and the prince of the air today? Satan. Satan. Where's their king? The birds of the air. Who is their prince? Satan. Who ate up the seed that fell by the way? The birds. The birds. These dirty birds that ate up the seed, by the way, where did they roost? In the isms of Christendom. Alright? Now, out here in Christendom, also, along with Christendom flows Christianity. I had a friend that wrote a Doctor sees his actual call. Actually, one time it was called the Ecclesia, the Ecclesia versus Christendom. The Ecclesia versus Christendom. And this is that mustard tree, that monstrosity. If you study the history of the Church of Rome and the mysteries, the secrets of all of that cloaked area, of all of their finery, it all goes back to paganism and some demonic worship that they had in past, in times past. God told us always to be separate from that type of thing. In verse 33, the Lord spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like Leaven in the Bible. What is leaven? Yeast. It's yeast. But what is leaven in the Bible? A type of sin, sin, error, lies, so on and so forth. Now, look up here on this little map. Most Have you got this map? This little map up here? It's got the church age on it. Well, this mustard tree, the expanse of this mustard tree, she lives in this whole age. Okay? This whole period of time here. This Christendom will inhabit the church age. But true New Testament churches will also inhabit the church age, won't you? Won't they? Why? What scripture can you give me that, that proves that true New Testament churches will all exist until the Lord comes back? What scripture are you going to give me? Hmm? It's in the book of Matthew. 
Matthew 16 and verse 18. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Now this explains a lot of that. What, what the Lord told Peter in Matthew 16 and verse 18, He said, You are Peter. You are a small stone. But upon this great gigantic foundation stone I shall be building my church. And the gates of hell shall not wrestle her down. And in the last verse of, of Matthew, the 28th chapter, the last few verses, what it says. He told his little church, as you are going, or he said, as you have gone forth out into the world, make disciples. Make disciples. Teaching these disciples, baptizing these disciples, and teaching these disciples to guard with their lives that thing, those things that I have handed down to you. And he said, Lo, pay attention. I'll be with you until when? In the ages. Huh? Until the dark ages? In the ages. No. Until the end of the age. What end of the age is it? The end of the church age. So we know from the Lord's statement that there's going to be true New Testament churches here. Also from these parables, what does it also teach? That we're going to have to put up with heresy all the way through the church age. So the very time that the Lord founded His church, Satan had one over there too. It's, it's called Israel. If Israel was blinding people from the truth. They weren't leading people to the truth. They were blinding them. Israel was not teaching the truth in people's ears and making hearers to hear the truth, but they were deafening people. Jesus said that you, you are like a blind leading the blind. And both of you fall in the ditch. The blind leading the blind. Israel had lost sight of the truth. They had it. The scriptures that, that God had given, had given Israel were supposed to lead them to God and to keep them in close fellowship with God, weren't they? But what did they do with the scriptures? What did they do with the Scriptures? What did Israel do with the Scriptures? They added to them. They added to them and explained them away and they started worshiping the Scriptures instead of God. You go over there in the land of Israel today and you'll see those people standing up against that waiting wall over like this and reading these Scriptures and banging their head on the wall just like this. Reading and singing these Scriptures, banging their head on the wall. They're worshiping the Scriptures. They're not worshiping God. The God of heaven came down and they killed Him. They murdered him. They rejected the Messiah. He spoke another parable and said that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks or three majors of meal until it was all leaven. Leaven in the Bible has always been a type of sin, a type of error, a type of lies. Israel, when it came to the Passover, they were supposed to get all the leaven out of their house, weren't they? Now, they, God allowed them to, to, to bake their bread with leaven, all except for this one time of the year when it was, it was supposed to typify the, the coming Messiah. And in that Messiah was no sin whatsoever. Jesus took that bread, that unleavened bread, and He broke it, didn't He? And He said, this is my body that I give for you. And the wine, or the, or the fruit of the vine, get them off, get them off this case on blue, the fruit of the vine. He says, take this and drink it. It is the blood of the new covenant that I make with you. <coughs> we'll quit right there. <laughs> and uh, I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you late. I missed you guys this morning. Always miss you. Thank you for your attention tonight. Do you have any questions before I turn you out? Are you understanding this a little better? Is it? Are you seeing more in it than you ever saw before? Are you seeing the history of Christendom and Christianity? God, the Lord said it was going to happen that way. And you just look at history, it happened that way. Read that little book you got, that little trail of blood, and you will see Christendom grow and Christianity be small. He said, why does the 
the path unto destruction, but narrow is the gate of the way unto eternal life. And that's the way it's always been. But God has always had His representatives in the world from the beginning of time until now. There are representatives, administrators of His kingdom. And thank God that we are part of that administration in His kingdom. Now we're learning how to hold on to the key and to turn the key and to teach others the things of God. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you so much uh, for the truths in it. Help it to open our minds and our eyes and our ears and help us to be servants of yours today. Help us to sweep out the leaven. Help us to chop down the mustard trees. Help us to understand these things and get them out of our lives and out of our minds even though that we have to leave it and let it coexist with us until the end time when we know that you will gather it and bind it together and you'll take us out. Hope, open our minds, Father, to your word. Help us teach others these glorious, beautiful truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.